Hi, my name is Ellie, and my YouTube channel has the word cutie on it, so some people call me that. Recently I was walking with a friend, and I recounted him the Jewish story of the Golem of Prague. A few months later, while I was cleaning my library, I found this book, containing the story, and I wanted to send it to him. Though, I couldn't find a PDF online, I since have link in description. And with him being a misanthrope, I had no way to send it to him. So, I read the whole thing, rewrote it, did a bit of research as it's important to note, my perspective is biased by the fact that I'm not Jewish myself, and rewrote these few legends. These I read to him and to you all. So grab a cup of milk as I present... Place the, place the fucking, place the text, just... Our story begins with a man running down the streets of Worms, Germany, carrying a large bag. People are running after him, and soon enough, the guards stop him when he passes through. In his bag is a dead body. This man is one of those who would try to frame the Jews for the murder of Christians. On that same night, a child is born. Thus, he was destined to bring justice and comfort to the Jews. He is Judah, son of Bezalel, or Yehuda ben Bezalel and later to become the great Rabbi Lo. We set the stage on Prague, in the Jewish district. Children are dying of the plague, and there is no end to the worries the adults face. The Rabbi Lo spends day and night looking for solution. All he does is slowly exhaust himself as time runs shorter for the last generation of Jews in Prague. That is, until one day when the prophet Eli, you know what, fuck it, yes, relation, comes to him in a dream. He brings him to the cemetery of all the children are buried. When midnight comes around, and very much to Rabbi Lo's wonder, they all burst from their graves and dance and play around in their shroud. The next morning, he tasks his bravest disciple with lying in wait in the cemetery for the hour of midnight. On the twelfth ringing of the bell, the children rise from their graves and dance just as they did in the dreams of Rabbi Lo. The disciple lies in ambush and repeatedly grasps for their shroud but can't grab them, for his hands shake too much from the fear. Eventually, he finds the confidence to get a good grasp out of the children's clothes, to get a good grasp out of a child's shroud, and steal them from him. When midnight ends, all the children go back to their graves, save for one. He pleads to get his shroud back, so that he can go to the rest, but the disciple stays true to his words, and brings it to Rabbi Lo. Rabbi Lo interrogates this poor child into the causes of the plague that cost so many lives. Thus, the child spoke with a more adult tongue. Two women in town killed their own kids and hid it from the people of Prague. To punish them, God called upon a plague until they confessed. As we rise on a new day, Rabbi Lo calls a town meeting to bring justice to the two infanticides. With their punishment, the plague is finally called off and the Jewish people of Prague live to see the next plague later in the book. Story 2, Jacob's Adventure In the town of Prague long ago lived this wealthy merchant who wanted to marry off his only son, a smart boy named Jacob. This year, like all the others, three merchant friends and consultants from distant lands came to him to talk and share some drinks. And he mentioned this to them. They replied enthusiastically with tales of another rich merchant far away looking off to marry his daughter. She was pretty and smart, and they would be willing to accompany Jacob for his voyage to meet her. The father, understandably shaky on his decision, asks for three days and three nights to think about it. It takes up his full thought, awaken asleep, not wanting to go with his only son, but still needing him married. Until on the very last night, he goes to Rabbi Lo. The wise rabbi understands the dilemma, but if it's for the happiness of his son, he tells him, he should do it. Satisfied with that answer, the merchant goes to bed. The next morning, preparations are made and Jacob's ready to leave. Through the deserts and the valleys, the scorpions and the snakes, Jacob would have a long journey with these three men until arriving in the city. There, so crooked before him, a massive tower with, at very top, a huge library. Go! Quench your thirst for knowledge, they tell him. We will have a servant bring you food every day, before locking the door behind them. Confused as to where his wife to be was, but not yet deterred, he started reading as he had for all his life. It's when he heard laughter. Now you've done it, you fool! Jacob looked around, but couldn't find the source of the sound until a talking head gestured in his direction. You see, there is no fiancé! 
Every 18 years, these people find promising young men and capture them for their arcane ritual. They lock them in this very room, promise them the library, and once they've learned enough, cut off their heads and stick the sigil of the beast on their tongue to make them predict the future. I was the previous one, but now that you're here, I can finally be free! Jacob will not have any of this, and instead decides to look for a way out. Oh, you will be trapped here forever. The talking here continues. Unless you escape this very night. But please, take me with you and bury me properly. And so, while the men are sleeping, Jacob ties up all the curtains of the library and makes himself a rope to climb down the tower. With the cover of night, he takes a camel and rides back to the Jewish town in Prague, talking ahead in stow. His adventures were great, but he could finally come home safe to his merchant father and his teacher, Rabbi Long. And when the talking head, last of his lineage, was buried, his people were finally safe from these men that wish harm upon them. Yay! So yeah, my name is Zach. Story 3, The Emperor. You see, in the times where Rudolf II ruled over Bohemia, the Jewish people faced lies and discrimination. I would fear that those who influence his judgment on them. They called Rabbi Low to speed me up. Though these were dire times for the Jews, the emperor was not an easy man to have an audience with. The only moment he was visible by the people of Prague was on his stroll through the streets leading his royal carriage. Much of his people came to visit, crowds big enough to burst through the houses and, and thick enough, Rabbi Lu would have no chance to let himself be heard. He was not deterred by this and made a plan to post himself right on the streets on the path the emperor would take. As the carriage showed up, the crowd started shouting at him to get off. He did not move. As he got closer, people tried removing him from the street. He did not move. Finally, as the carriage was close enough, he could feel the horses pounding to the ground in front of him. People threw rocks and mud at him. And like magic, in the air, the rocks transformed into flowers that landed on his feet and the mud made a bed of petals. Seeing this, the emperor stopped the car to see this magical rabbi that was standing before him. Emperor, said Rabbi Lee, I must speak to you. Seven days later, we find Rabbi Lo at Prague Castle. A noble comes to talk to him. I have been sent by the Emperor to speak with you, for you cannot have audience with him right now. Answer my questions, and I will judge your wisdom myself. So the great rabbi began his speech. He spoke of the injustices the Jews faced, the lies about blood sacrifices, about his conviction in the Jewish faith and its laws and their good. Suddenly, the emperor appears in the room by lifting the curtain that hit him. Tis I, the emperor, says the emperor. I have hidden myself to judge your wisdom, and I am impressed. However, you must first answer me this question, and I'll decide whether to help. Rabbi Lo, sick of getting his wisdom tested, still patiently awaits the chance to save the Jewish town from further lies and discrimination. Tell me, wise rabbi, were the Jews responsible for the crucifixion of the Christ? Allow me to answer you with a parable. The emperor is intrigued. You see, there was a powerful king, and with him his only son. They were both quite happy, but people would spread lies against the prince that he would try to overthrow his father, the king. The king called him forth, but he stayed silent. He had no choice but to call his son to court. There were his charges, but he was still silent, and so the judges convicted him for treason. It was now up to the king to give his final say, and he remained silent. So tell me, Emperor, who bears more blame, the king or the judges? The Emperor understood the wisdom of the rabbi, and so promised him and his people protection under his rule. And so Rabbi Lo went to the Jews of the Jewish town. He who loves with his heart will have friendship in the king, for grace is on his lips. The 
closing month following were marked by visits from the emperor. Cancel for the rabbi and the demonstration of magic in the great halls of the castle. Though as Rabbi Lee grew closer to the king and his protection to the Jews grew more vast, his consultant came to see the great rabbi as a threat and began plotting behind his back. Oh, Emperor, we cannot see his scheme unraveling, but we can. Drive him away, lest his evil Kabbalah serves to replace you on the throne. And wavering as he always was, the Emperor called Rabbi Lee to tell him I will expel the Jews from Bohemia. You have until the end of the year, or I shall call my armies, and they will fly upon the Jewish stone like locusts upon a cursed field. The Jewish town was in panic. Families had been unpacking what a few belongings they thought they might carry with them, and selling out the rest to the Christians. Many tried to seek comfort in Mubailu, and he turned to them and spoke loud and clear. Fear not, for by tomorrow morning, this will all be over. And as the people went to sleep, the emperor snuck tightly out of the covers to them. He dreamed of being brought in a carriage to bathe in the Vistavo River under the sun. So by the time he was to be brought back, the carriage had left without him and his cloak were gone. What else is an emperor supposed to do but to talk back to his castle thinking bear? So he said something much. Women and children would avoid his gaze when he announced his presence. And any requests from foreclosed was matched with a look of disgust. That is until he meets a beggar in rags. Not knowing what a great and powerful emperor he is, the beggar takes pity and spares him a small piece of cloth. I may be adorned by fields and old towers, but you are even less fortunate. You've got nothing. Here, you can also taste my bread. Upon arriving near his castle, the emperor loudly proclaimed who he was, and all his acquaintances laughed. They'd seen the king room. He just came back from his bath. He was just some beggar out to suffer with. So the great emperor had to walk back slowly to crawl. On his way, he thought Rabbi Lu might help him. But Rabbi Lu will recognize him for the righteous king he is. He knocked on the door, and the great rabbi answered with his unusual smile. It's good to see you back here again. Can I offer you some food while you're there? The emperor explained everything. How he'd been bathing when he was bathing and forced his trip to town. Well, you see, says Rabbi, an impersonator has come to steal your clothes and is now living as a king. Though I might know how to get back to your throne, the emperor, having seen his status between him and his subject, was limited to this drugs, except to stop the exile of the Jews, whose status were limited to the group. And so the rabbi shares his plan. He would go back to the Vlitava river and play the same trick on the interstate. Hence, the great king got his butt back to the throne. Upon waking up, he rushed to his consultants and to Rabbi Lu to tell them all the Jews were to stay and be granted the protection back. Presumably, every Jew thought he was fucking insane forever after. Hello, I am Rabbi Lo of Prague. I have come to tell the story of... Here's a little distraction from the story of Rabbi Lo. I present... Yahweh did not mold the world out of clay. He spoke it into existence. Let there be light. Those words of power, carefully crafted from letters that transcend himself and the world. This is their story. As God was contemplating his infinite creation and the preparation for the instructions he would give those who inherited the Torah, the 22 letters danced around him, vying for his attention. Your holiness, your greatness, king of all kings, look at me, they said. Eventually their pleas were heard and God let them make their case. First came Aleph. The most confident letter. I am the first letter of all the letters, it said. 
I am the one that represents your oneness to the universe. What letter is better off to start off your title as the one god beyond other gods? Elohim. That is true. Sorry, fine. You will manifest with two gimbals, one on top, one on the bottom, separated and united by a bomb, showing my connection in the things I make from the holy role to the earthly one by my holy instructions in the Torah. You will symbolize my very self, as Aleph is Yahweh. The letter is satisfied and leaves. Next is Beth. It struts along and says, I am too, I am he, and I am you. I am the difference between holy and earthly, dark and light, high and low. Through me, man will be an extension of your power, and an agent unto himself, like the heat within the fire, like the wood that makes up the shelf. What well, better is there than the letter Beth to start off your instruction to the your Feth? And Yahweh agreed that the rhyming was impressive, but annoying and had to say. You will manifest as a house, one line below, one line around, houses the containers for humans, and flesh the one for soul. I will start the Torah with you, a mesh with tightened holes. Third was Gimel, the unity between Aleph and Beth, manifesting like a river splitting in two paths, merging. And then Dalit, He, Bav. This continued until there was only one left, Tav. Tav was different. Tav was silent. Tav did not push, did not beg, contained its excitement. Why make yourself so small? God asked. Oh yeah, only this, I'm not worthy of your great big book, I'm last of all. God liked his humility and said, You are the last, and so you shall complete it. You are everything, circling back to itself, only to begin anew. So, I shall start the Torah off with Bereshit Baru, I mean Bara, and thus completes the first word of the Torah. Bereshit, marking the two-ness of those meant to read it, ending on the call to return to the oneness of God. Alright, now I'm going to tell you the big one, the story of the God. But first, Sir Connor Brick will stay. Yeah. So let's talk about about why I did this. I really did read the uh, the book here. I read it in its entirety. It's pretty short. It's uh, somewhere around 100 pages. Not even 90-something. 90 97, 100. Uh, and I really did like it. Um, so the interesting part about it is, is while I was reading it, I, I already had the idea to sort of, uh, sort of write this entire thing along with it. So the characters were already developing in my mind as my own characters. Um, and then they kept growing beyond that, actually. They, they kept growing story after story into to more of my own thing and, and sort of people I started liking, right? Like, like the Avengers Marvel, right? Yeah. I wrote that and I, I started relating to them and I started connecting them and all the, all the sad points about it made me feel actually sad to, to write them out even though it's fiction and that, that made me sort of recontextualize like fiction and and uh, culture and stuff and that was really nice and now I'm reading these to you and I, I really like to do that because I think there's great stories I think they're I've written them really well I think what I've added is really nice and speaking of what I've added um, what do you have to say about it? Um, I mean you, you have a good come uh, off this is a good plume so thank you you're ready really well thank you and um it's cool that you're not Jewish and you just... <laughs> it's cool you're not Jewish. I really <laughs> no, appreciate that. <laughs> like, it's, not, it's not your religion, but you still right. manage to write something. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. I, I really hope I manage to actually like do it justice because uh, it's hard. But uh, the thing I like with the story is that the book itself is in French. So you did manage to translate... I didn't French. translate it. I didn't translate it. I read the stories and then I rewrote them. So I tried to summarize, I tried to add some details if, if it's details I found in, in other versions of the stories or like somewhere else and then sort of write it in my own style but still within like the context. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's still amazing. Thank you. Yeah. 
It's not. It's not that it's. It's long. It's just that there's something. With the stories that. I don't know. Call you. And yeah. Fantastic. Nice. That's our table, <coughs> and uh. Yeah. Doing some washing. All right. <clears throat> Here's the one you've all been waiting for. Story six: The Goblin Rises. <laughs> <laughs> If the Empress promised the Jews were safe from the Emperor, though not safe from the people, some would still, as they had the night the great rabbi was born, carry corpses into the Jewish town to spur the accusations that were the blood libel. One night, Rabbi Lo went to sleep with the worry of these accusations on his mind, and in his dreams, God came to him. With the clay from the earth, create a golem, halfway between man and earth, alive and still. He will protect you in times of need. In his visions also came the holy word, Emmet, truth. The rest of his night was dreamless, and morning came fast. He spent the rest of the day in his study, reading and researching for magical incantations, part of the Kabbalah that would make the earth rise, and the rest of the next day perfecting them, until finally he had three formulas, one for the power of water, one for the power of fire, and one for the power of air. Gollum would only be complete if he embodied all four elements. Then he grabbed his bravest and his most devout disciple, and all three set for the banks of the Vltava. They formed the clay, and then each time an incantation was performed, it got bigger, more human-like. Finally, Rabbi Lo inserted the word Emmet into the mouth of Gollum, rendering him complete. He moves just like a man, rises from the earth, opens his mouth to speak, but no words come out. Secrets to language and its arcane powers are still guarded by God, so the Gollum created by man will be mute. Gollum, says Rabbi Lo, your name shall be Joseph. You shall serve a holy task of protecting the Jews. The sanctity of these tasks must be respected, for it is written, do not use a sacred tool for a mundane purpose. And Joseph acquiesces. Story 7, Wacky Hijinks. This is the fun chapter, guys. It's the one about fish. Alright, so Joseph has generally been a good dude all around, saving people from danger, solving murder mysteries. He's sort of just a permanent fixture of the town now, though he's still undercover as a random mute man that lives somewhere in Rabbi Lowe's basement on one of his benches. People just don't question his superhuman strength or speed. They don't judge him. He's just Joseph, the mute man. So it's Pessa, and Rabbi Lowe's wife, Pearl, is running all over the place trying to prepare for the festivities. She walks by the golem, then again, and again, and the fourth time she goes, Well, fuck, Pessa is a holy thing, right? I'll ask Joseph for help. Joseph is standing still on his bench, menacingly. Joseph? She asks. Go fetch me a water. He leaps out of his chair and runs out of the house, buckets in hand. Satisfied, she goes off to do her groceries. When she comes back, there's a crowd around the house water floating down the streets, and praising of Rabbi Lo for having created a magic source of water. Her mind immediately goes to Joseph. Just then, he rushes past her with buckets full, and leaves as fast as he came with buckets empty. She tells him to stop, and just as soon as he would flood the house, he puts down the buckets where he's standing and goes to rest, satisfied with the job well done. At another event, a wedding this time, Pearl is tasked with preparing the food. Now she remembers the water incident, but she thinks Okay, surely, a wedding has to be holy, right? Sure, there's two simple things from him. One, get one fish from the merchant, come back, and two, get apples for the wedding at the apple merchant, and hands him a note to show to both. Joseph leaves at reasonable speed, and Pearl goes back to cooking. At the fish merchant, Joseph shows the note, gets the fish, and is about to leave back home. When the fish, angry to be taken out of the water, slaps him in the face, Joseph gets pissed and throws the fish back in the Vlatava to punish him. The fish is satisfied and Joseph angrily walks back home. When Pearl asks about the fish, Joseph wildly gestures in the air about what happened. They become quite good at communicating that way. And Pearl sighs and goes back to cooking, forgetting about the second order. Not the golem, though. He heads to the market and presents the note to the apple lady. She carefully weighs the apples and hands them to him in a very small bag. Joseph tries to explain that he's really strong and could carry way more apples. Say, the whole table with her on it. 
This only serves to make her laugh, to which Joseph gets angry. So he picks her up, puts her on the table, picks up the table, and walks home. <laughs> By the time they get home, she is absolutely terrified, but Joseph is nice. He picks her back up and sits her down in the way she was at the market. She is now to sell apples in she is now to sell apples in front of Ravello's house. The whole neighborhood goes into a state of general panic. Joseph is pleased with his work and goes back to the bench. Okay, last one. Twice, the great rabbi had the chance to learn not to mess with the golem. Still, he thought, since it's Rosh Hashanah and the weather is so bad, no fisherman can get them fish. Surely. Surely, this is holy enough. Well, he tells Joseph to go get fish, and Joseph, as per his usual, fucks off at the speed of a reasonably busy man. Rabbi Lowe goes back to repairing the festivities. It's only late in the evening that he remembers he sent the golem to fish, and he hasn't come back. He puts two and two together, and runs to find him. Fortunately for the rabbi, Joseph was not a hard man to find next to his oversized bag of fish, half alive and thoroughly confused. You know how it goes now. Rabbi Lo orders Joseph to stop, and so he puts all the fish back in the river, leaving the river full of now dead fish, and goes back home, satisfied that he protected the Jewish people. End it. Please. In the years since he was created, Joseph, the mute man that inexplicably hung out in Rabbi Lo's basement, started making friends. He couldn't speak, but People will come to admire him at work, his strength, his dedication, and most of all, the heart he was putting more and more into it. Some would approach him, and to this, they would receive wild gesturing back. When people learned these gestures, they started saluting him whenever they saw him with the same hand motions he was seen doing. And the golem on his end started caring for them as he saw them beyond his divine task. Out of those people, there was one to care about the most. She was a little child often away from home when her mercy parents left. She accompanied Joseph on his daily chores. One day, though, she didn't show up, and, and Rabbi Lo authorized the golem to leave his duties to look for her. He searched far and wide, up and down the Jewish town, gesturing alarmedly to anyone he came across with no avail. So, he searched beyond the walls, there, using detective powers that had so many times before saved the Jews, he found the culprits that took her for ransom to her rich parents inside one of the houses of Prague. Though he was a peaceful guardian of the Jews, upon seeing her he was filled with rage and grew bigger and bigger into a massive clay that would crush the house, sparing only one terrified little girl who ran back home. By the time Joseph awoke much later, he was so horrified by what he had done that he rushed to Rabbi Lo. They both saw it wise to kill the golem, who had just become the slightest bit human. And solemnly, Rabbi Lo, Joseph, and the two assistants present for the birth of the golem march to the old new synagogue. There in the attic, they sat him down for the last time. They raised the aleph from the emmet, truth, in his mouth to make it met. Finally, the golem remained at peace, forever satisfied of his work in helping the Jews. The Rose. Rabbi Lo was getting old, such that his age could only be compared to the length of his beard. But still, when another plague came to the Jewish town, he jumped to their aid. It was a hard time for them all, so he decided to take a midnight stroll through the cemetery to find a cure. There in the darkness stood a figure. Though cloaked, nearly invisible, he recognized it. He was death, waving the list in front of them. Those who would die the next day. Without hesitating, the rabbi ripped it from the bony fingers of death and ran home to burn it and in the flames that his own name to be spared from the slaughter to come. But death was not so merciful to forget him. In the years that came to follow, they put traps to catch him, and every time he would recognize them and turn around wisely. And he lived like that for some time, always escaping death with the wisdom he had accumulated all those years. That is how, at ninety, Rabbi Lewis still had eyes that contained the embers of the autumn sun, though now with white, silky hair. He was loved by all he had helped. And that same birthday, surrounded by loved ones, he is offered a rose to smell by a child. He bends down, takes a whiff, and the rose falls from his fingers. For though he was wise and old, his heart was still open, and death, which hidden itself in the fragrance of the rose, could make its way in and take its revenge. 
lessens the life of Rabbi Lo, or Judah, son of Bezalel. Though not his story, for many years later, his grandson would also come to die. By that point, the cemetery had gotten more crowded and the space next to him was taken. That night, Rabbi Lo, graceful as ever, moved his grave to allow his grandson to be buried by his side. Well, it's not the end of this book either. We do have one more story until we have to see each other again another day. And the story will be told by me. Story 10, Golem Forever. After Rabbi deactivated the Golem, he warned everyone about the dangers of going to the attic of the old new cemetery. He forbade it and locked the door behind him for it, or so he had hoped. But many, many years later, we made his call. He's heard, he's heard, old ta ta he's heard old tales of a man creating a female servant out of clay to do his household. It's only when he hears about the calling of Rabbi Lee that he decides to go to the old new cemetery and recreate his own garden for personal. Though he's foolish, that is clear, he's not unlearned and takes the time to make his own shem to insert into the garden's garden. He sneaks into the old new synagogue in the dead of night and with ease manages to pick the lock placed the case before him. On his bench, he finds what remains of Joseph. Still, homeless by cracks of blood. The skull suddenly put the shem in his mouth, only dreaming of everything he could make the garden do. Meanwhile, the golem suddenly appears. The cracks fade, and he grows. His thorax rises, then falls, then rises, then falls. The golem comes alive, slowly, while growing and growing. By the time the scholar even notices, the golem's taken up twice his size already, and he shows no sign of stopping. Soon, the wolf won't contain him. He's grown into a hideous mass of clay, barely resembling a human anymore. The scholarly family discovers the golem wasn't supposed to be resurrected and runs to remove the shaft from his mouth. It perfectly he made it. The golem stops growing, he stops moving, and then collapses under his own weight. The scholar has paid the price of his foolishness. For he created an imperfect being with an imperfect shem and an imperfect intention. That was the last time anyone has stepped foot in the attic. For the rest will need Rabbi Lou's warning. Well, until the 1883 innovations, but they didn't try to restore the column, so oof, we're good. <laughs> Quite an adventure, wasn't it? Don't worry, you'll get more eventually. But for today, story time is over. I'll see you all after class, and you have a good weekend. Okay, let me read the funniest line from the Book of Splendor, Francis Sherwood, page 34. The entire village burned to the ground. All the men were massacred. Your mother is a whore. <laughs>